very much. So, as we mentioned, my name is Julie, and I am very excited to be with you this morning. Let me just see if that's that. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. That's not it. Okay, so I'll do my best and we'll see what happens. There we go. All right. Thank you. You know, young people in technology. <laughs> All right, so. Um, I am a missionary with Jet. I'm going to Japan, and Jet has two main objectives. Number one, to sensitize Quebec's youth to missions through one month long mission trips in the summer. The second one is to send full time missionaries. Since I'm going to Japan as a full time missionary, you will have understood that I am in the second Jet branch. I am from a family of three children. I am the eldest. And I come from a small area of Quebec called Lake Sargent. So that's easier in English to say because in French it all here Lac Saint Jean. Uh -huh. So yeah, it's about a three hour difference. So that's the difference between Lac Saint Jean and Lac Sergent, which is where I'm from. <laughs> and I accepted the Lord as my personal savior when I was five, but it was only when I was nine that I felt the Lord's calling to go into missions. We often had missionaries coming over because they came to my church to learn French and then would go to one of three countries, Togo, Congo, Niger. So those were the three mission fields I was aware of as a child. <laughs> but I was called because during one of the presentations, a missionary was talking about what he would be doing in Niger and they clearly heard, listen well, because one day it'll be you. And so that's when I knew I was called into missions. But it was only my third year of university that I knew I was called to go to Japan when I read that 10% of Japanese youth say they wish they had never been born. Not, I don't understand what to do with my life, I'm a little bit lost. Like, there's nothing for me on this earth. I simply wish I was not on it. So I am a youth group leader in my home church have been for six years now, and the reason I'm there is because I love them and I have a burden for them. So reading about it, I really asked God, all right, is this where you want me to go and serve you? After a five week long exploration journey in Japan, I had peace to say yes, that is where he's calling me, and since I took that step, I haven't looked back and I feel completely at peace with it. Now, I'm talking about Japan, so you might want to learn a little bit more about it. This is Japan over there, so it's pretty much as far as you can get from here. Um, that implies there are a few different things, like population. They are 127 million, about. And uh, on the surface of about area of Newfoundland and Labrador. So this can create, you know, a little bit of shortage of space. That's a pool. Um, this is rush hour, Japanese rush hour. I have personally seen this. There is literally a man with the white gloves shutting people in. And uh, people are happy. They say, if he doesn't push me in, I won't, get, I won't catch my train and then I'll be late for work. And that's not a possibility, right? <coughs> However, because depends on mountainous, then you do have countryside. So 40% of the population is concentrated in three cities. So there is a beautiful countryside. It is far, but there are some things that we do recognize. Wow. So there's McDonald's, and you've got PFK as well. They all go there for Christmas. They understand that for Christmas they have to eat chicken. That's what they got from the West. Japanese eat chicken at Christmas. There is one thing though that's very different, and that's religion. Now to the Japanese, religion is something you wear like a coat, and when it doesn't suit you, you take it off. It can also be mixed and matched like you would mix and match clothes. So, to them, the Japanese is both Buddhist and Shintoist, both of them. But they don't believe it, does not change their heart. But if religion is not what determines their course of action in different, you know, circumstances, what does? Well, the notion of harmony. To them, harmony is not something that means we all get along. It's more a synonym of conformity. It means to be the same as everyone else. And so, in these circumstances, then I mean, it's not that surprising that there 
eight times fewer Christians in Japan than in Quebec, to the province of Quebec. So what will I be doing in Japan? Well, I'm going there to get, work with the youth, as I've said. Oh, sorry about that. Christians first. You want to learn about Japanese Christians, right? Um, so to them, since being the same as everybody else is so important, well, evangelizing is really hard. Because what are you doing when you evangelize? You're doing two things. One, saying, I'm different. Hmm. Two, saying, you should be different too. Well, in their mind, that's how it sounds. And so evangelism is something that is a big hurdle for a Japanese Christian. Also, well, if religion is like clothing that you take off, you just do the rites, and you know that's good, you don't, you're not supposed to believe in it, well, that doesn't work with Jesus. Jesus says, I want your heart. I don't want your, only your actions. I want your whole heart. Your actions will overflow from that. So that's something that's very hard for them to understand and especially apply. But then if you're having a hard time evangelizing and giving your whole life to God, then you know, growth for the church is very slow and or sometimes inexistent. So I will be working with the youth. And sometimes people wonder, well, how are you supposed to make them you know, understand they need Jesus? Because to them, the Japanese, they have a very low criminality rate. And so they think, we're not sinners, we're good people. But one missionary said, one way I found to overcome this is that I tell them, well, are you pure? Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a sinner, but I, I'm not pure. He says, well, you know, when you go to the bathroom, why do you do that? Well, I, why do you, no, sorry, not why you do go to the bathroom, but when they go to the bathroom, they change slippers. They have home slippers and bathroom slippers, and they have to change. Because if not, they're taking the impurity of the bathroom all over the house, and you're not supposed to do that. So he says, why do you do that? Well, so that I won't take all the impurities all around the house. He says, well, God is perfect and pure. He cannot accept anything that is not pure in his presence. So, you need Jesus in order to come to God, and so that's how the Japanese person understood, oh, I do need somebody to save me, I do need somebody to change me. And so, I will be working with the youth, with Bill and Becky, because they do need a lot of help with young people, very few churches have young people, and I will help the youth grow through weekly meetings, also help them to evangelize, not just me evangelizing them, but them going to their friends and enabling them, what, how do I talk to them about Jesus? Do I really have to? Well, the answer is yes, but you know, there's a nice way to put it. And also to help the Japanese get involved as leaders with their own youth. However, for that to be as effective as possible, that I need my ministry, I really need people here that will pray for me. And so I'm looking for 722 prayer partners so that means 103 people per day, so plus me, that makes 722, we're good on the math, that will pray for me. So that every day there are intercessors praying for what's going on in Japan. If you would like to become a prayer partner, well, you can simply, oops, there we go, write your name on this sheet. It's a sign-up sheet, it's right at the back. You write your name. And then email or postal address, I can post letters, that's fine. And the day on which you would like to pray. I especially need prayer on Saturdays, well, Fridays and Saturdays. Because that's usually when the youth ministry happens, the youth activities, youth meetings. So if it's on your heart to pray, then you can simply sign up at the back, take a prayer card. Oops. Okay, this. okay. prayer card. Put it somewhere you see often, and then... I will send you every other month my prayer letters called The Rising Sun. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be at the back at the end, or I'll be eating downstairs too afterwards, and uh, we can talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Worship King, for leading us to the throne of grace and songs of praise to our Savior, the great God. We have. What a great God we serve. And, uh, thinking of uh, what Julie said and the importance of prayer. And sometimes we take even uh, that uh, ministry for granted. 
where even the Apostle Paul recognized the importance of it when he wrote in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 when he, when he says, He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and that's all that he'd been through, the Apostle Paul, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks to give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor God granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So let us not forsake that the altar. Let us not for, forsake the prayer closet because there's great power and, and uh, purpose in prayer as we stay, we're engaging in the Lord's work and praying for God's people all across not only this land, but across the world. And thank you, uh, Jimmy, for that, uh, that informative uh, talk and presentation. And uh, we trust we have some prayer warriors right here in our midst, and I'm sure they're going to be signing that paper. All right, so that's an encouragement for us to pray. And uh, they don't mention uh, financial needs, but I will on their behalf. Of course, it costs money to go over there and to live over there and uh, do inquire about that as well, uh, if uh, the Lord is leading in that direction. Okay, question. I like that when we start with questions. Define situation ethics. Well, situation ethics is the doctrine of flexibility in application of moral laws according to circumstances. In other words, when in Rome, do as the Romans. That is situation ethics. Situation ethics is a concern of the church of Jesus Christ. It should be a concern because as we look at the world around us and the society in which we live and we see how morally lax society is becoming in an ever increasing measure, we can be influenced by that. We see it, we're, we're just uh, bombarded with that. Uh, uh, the morality of society and the lack thereof, whether it be in the different forms of media, whether it be in conversation, whether we, see, we just see with our own eyes going on and on. But I have another question. And this influences uh, situation ethics. The doctrine of flexibility is actually influenced by something else, another doctrine. And this uh, question is, does your circumstance define your theology? Does your circumstance define your theology? Or does your theology define your circumstances? And that's an important question that we need to ask ourselves. In other words, if I was to ask you, what do you think of God? You may very well define who God is and what he's like according to where you're at in your life and what you're going through. And we call this circumstantial theology. Circumstantial theology. And there's a real danger in that. There's a real danger in that. For example, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see everything as a nail. And every problem has a nail. And I'm always impressed when I was just uh, helping out for the whole two hours that I helped out downstairs. But seeing Eddie with just this uh, supply of tools for every type of situation. And basically all I know how to use is a hammer. I'm going to do everything with a hammer. Break things down with a hammer. Fix things with a hammer. But you know... we. We have a hammer sometimes and how we use it. And that's called our emotions and feelings. And that's why circumstances can play such a big role in our lives is because we respond emotionally. We were created that way. We weren't created as Vulcans. And I recognize that. But we need to be careful 
with our feelings and looking at our circumstances because that can interpret our, we can interpret God by our circumstances. And if God does this, then I will believe in Him. Or I believe God up until a point and then no further. There are many examples of those who did go through a season and a time of circumstantial theology. They were in their circumstances and then they perceived and defined God in a certain way based upon their circumstances. And we see them even, even uh, 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 John the Baptizer. Remember when he was in prison? In Matthew chapter 11? And he was... It, he was filled with the Spirit from such an early age. He was such a, a preacher uh, of, the, of the gospel and he was standing out there. But yet when he was in prison, he sent people to Jesus and said, is he the one that I should be speaking about? Because he looked at his circumstances in the prison and said, boy, this isn't turning out the way I thought it would. However, we do see others who rose above their circumstances. And I was reading in Daniel chapter 6 where they made a decree that you must pray. You cannot pray to any other God. So what did Daniel do? He went right to his prayer closet and prayed three times a day. He didn't allow circumstances to influence his theology. But his theology rose above his circumstances. I'd like to talk a little bit about that here this morning. Circumstantial theology. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Joshua? Or excuse me, Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Following Joshua, the second book in the books of history of Israel. Prior to the captivity. And before we go any further, let's just pause in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you already for what has already transpired this morning. How our hearts have been stirred. And hearing about your work going forward as we sang praises to you. As we meet together, Lord, truly we want to hear from you. That our time here and being spent here together would not be in vain, but Lord, you have a purpose and a plan. May you reveal yourself to us this morning, perhaps in a manner that you haven't before. Speak through me that I would simply be your mouthpiece, recognizing, Lord, my own frailty, failures, shortcomings. I ask, Lord, that. You would just minister to each and every one of us as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I want to introduce to you Gideon. In Joshua cha Judges chapter 6, excuse me, we're studying the book of Joshua on Wednesday next Bible study. That's why by accident I may refer to the book of Judges as Joshua on occasion. Judges chapter 6. That would be your, the seventh book in the Old Testament. And in Judges, Judges is a unique, unique period of time because it spans a period of time following the death of Joshua and prior to the time of the monarchy when kings were instituted. Circa 1350 to 1050, a 300 year period. They were over a thousand years before Christ. And we read that uh, God raised up these judges in the book of Judges to lead the people. The word judge, as is refer referred to when speaking about the leaders, and the leaders, the, as referred to judges, were not just judges in the sense that we would interpret or define because we're thinking in today's terms, but judges were responsible not only for... Uh, the civil laws of the nation, but as well the military uh, manners of uh, the nation and uh, even how they were to protect the people. They were seen as leaders, really, or the judges. 
So God would raise up these judges. And in Judges chapter 6, we're introduced to the fifth judge who was to lead the people. Beginning to read at verse 1. Chapter 6. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midians. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. So you see, the beginning of this chapter details the oppressive, aggressive nature and power of Midian along with other nations, the Amalekites and Eastern peoples, probably uh, nations east of the Jordan River, who invaded and pillaged the Israelites of their possessions. They left nothing for them. They were impoverished, were the Israelites, to the point where they finally cried out to God. As it says in verse 6, Meaning so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Not what necessarily leads up to verse 6, but the results is that people cried out to God. When people see their own impoverished state, isn't it good to know you can look to the Lord and He hears our cry? When we cry to him. Verse 7. When the Israelites cry out to the Lord because of Midian. He sent them a prophet. Who said. This is what the Lord the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. You see, there was a theological reason for their adverse circumstances. And it's stated in verse 10. Basically it comes down to this. You have not listened to me. Next we read that the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. And says to Gideon, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon's response is classic. Pardon me, my Lord? In verse uh, 13. You see, I don't think this statement was made simply out of respect. I think this statement was made. Gideon's response made in almost an incredulous manner. Are you talking to me? What are you saying? I can't believe what you're saying. You know someone may say something to you that uh, maybe completely catch you off guard to the point that you said, pardon me? It's like, what are you talking about? So what, the, the angel of the Lord says, this is by way of introduction. He says to to Gideon, that you are a mighty warrior. Gideon is in no place to receive that kind of statement, that he's a mighty warrior. In verse 12, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You see, in, in, in this one verse, three things are said about God in relation to Gideon. First of all, he, he appears to who? A group of people collectively, an individual. An individual. This is personal contact. What makes our God so unique is that he is interested in an individual. Personal. We call, we call what we have as Christians a personal relationship with a living, the living God. Not only is there a personal relationship, but it's a powerful relationship. He calls Gideon a warrior. If we read Gideon and what he's going through and where he's at, he doesn't believe what God's saying, basically. You know that God says that to each child of God? You are a warrior. 
Or excuse me, I won't use the term warrior. In Romans chapter 8, there's another term used to describe the Christian. Paul says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Warrior, well, conqueror is even better because that's what a warrior should be doing is conquering. And so we are in a place as Christians today if I can make that application, whereby we are called conquerors in our standing before God. Are you living up to that standing? Are you claiming that promise from God? Also, it's not only about a personal relationship, a powerful relationship, but it emphasizes one where there is presence. Look what the Lord says in verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. It's also talking about his presence. The Lord's presence. In the relationship. We're not going through this journey, this life, on our own anymore as his children. But we have the presence of God living inside us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us, he says. As Julie mentioned, the religions, other religions, people wear their religions like their clothes and they just take them off. And there's no longer is that part of their lives anymore. But you see, when you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you take his presence wherever you go. He is with you. So in one verse, how much is God saying? And finally, we'll also realize, and we'll also read that this is a purposeful relationship. There's purpose behind God's plans. And he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And that's what Gideon need to uh, be reminded of. Because we can talk about Gideon and, and, and how much we learn from studying, studying Gideon as the fifth judge over Israel. And our hearts are inspired by much of what follows, as we'll read, that the, how the Lord used Gideon. But there was a time and a period where Gideon was looking at his circumstances, and based upon his circumstances, he was defining his theology, in other words, who God was. So let's learn some lessons. Circumstantial theology, lesson number one is that God, God is um, interested in you as an individual, as a person. Look where the angel finds Gideon. He's threshing wheat in a wine press to eat out a living. That's his existence. Now, for one thing, you weren't supposed to be threshing in a wine press. But Gideon was doing that to hide from the enemy so that they would not find the little bit that he would gain from threshing in a wine press. Because he was fearful of losing what he was earning because of the enemy. We need to be reminded that when it comes to biblical theology and not circumstantial theology, God is in control. And God will provide our needs. Based upon our standing, we can rely upon the promises that he makes. Not only in his standing, in his place, and how God describes him as a mighty warrior in the name, but also the place of where he was living. What does, why does he stand? How does he answer God, Gideon, when God says you're a mighty warrior? Okay, let's begin reading in verse 13. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? 
But now the Lord has abandoned us here, abandoned us and given us into the, land, the hand of Midian. You see, circumstantial theology lesson number two is that we have a selective memory. That's what circumstantial theology uh, results in, a selective memory. Gideon has to go all the way back to deliver, when, when God delivers the Israelites out of bondage from Egypt. That would have been decades ago, looking back at the time in which Gideon is. Tens and tens, and if not hundreds of years, Gideon is going back. Oh yeah, what is, where is that God? Whereas earlier, what does God say? What does God remember that he did for the Israelites? In verse 9, I, when the prophet is speaking here, who this prophet is, we're, we're not informed, but he says, I rest, representing the Lord, he says, I rescued you, you from the hands of the, the Egyptians. That's true. Gideon did say that. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you your land, their land, in where Gideon was now living. Gideon didn't talk about that part. He didn't mention that part. You see, he had a selective memory. He only went back further. But you see, God did more than just one miracle when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He had to do another miracle to bring the Israel. Of course, in the wilderness there were many miracles that Gideon, of course, did not recount to the Lord, the angel of the Lord. But even when God, God brought them into the land in which Gideon was now living, that was a supernatural work in itself. You've got to go back to Joshua chapter 3. Why didn't Gideon recount this? When he's telling the Lord, you've forsaken us. All we can talk about is Egypt. The crossing of the, the Jordan talks about all that God did. Look at verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stages all during the harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan, and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. What a miracle that God performed so that the nation could enter in, enter onto that dry ground called the Promised Land. It was a miracle, and not to mention what happened to Jericho. You see, Gideon didn't even mention that either. You see, when we, when we think of circumstantial theology, we start to define God and define God by our circumstances. We become selective. Oh yeah, yeah, Lord, this is what you did in the past. Yeah, Christians today, sometimes we're like, I remember when I was saved. That's all you can remember that God delivered you from since your salvation? How has God blessed you? How has God provided for you since then? The riches of Christ that he's lavished upon you. What about those relationships that you've made since your salvation? The people that have encouraged you. The prayers that have been offered up for you. Or that you offered to God and you've seen answered prayer. Are you simply forgetting that because you're going through a difficult time presently? Selective theology. We need to be careful of how we define, when we start to define God by our circumstances. It's a selective memory. Huh. So we see that the Lord provided many, many, many blessings for the Israelites that Gideon just wanted to forget about. Hmm. And what about the family the Lord has blessed you with? What about the friends the Lord has blessed you with? answered prayer, or what about the open doors of opportunity that God has provided for you? Giving glory to God for his rich blessings he showered upon us, giving his present circumstances and his view of the people's plight, even questioning God's presence. If the Lord is with us, 
Look at verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. If the Lord is with you, look what Gideon says, but if the Lord is with us, in other words, questioning the presence of God in his life and in the people's lives, corporately, questioning the presence of God in our lives is not only selfish, but also dangerous. It is bringing into question God's faithfulness and his loving kindness, resulting in us feeling more alone and isolated. If we think of the unbeliever who does not enjoy the rich blessing and the, the pleasure of referring to God as our Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, how sad is it when Christians forget their Father in Heaven, are reminded of this story, that God is a Father to the fatherless. Karen's alcoholic and abusive father abandoned uh, his family when she was two years old. Every Father's Day, her mother made her write a card to the father she never knew. Her father never responded. Although Karen's father never accepted her, she found a different way to fill the void. She learned at church that God could be her father. Whenever she went out to play on her roller skates, she yelled, hey God, look at me. She felt a special awareness of his presence, as if God were smiling from heaven. Rather than focusing her attention on the man who abandoned her, she directed her affection toward God who is a father to the fatherless, as it says in Psalm 68. Although she never received approval from her earthly father, Karen found security through her heavenly father. May we be reminded of God's presence. If you're a child of God, he knows your name. He knows your needs. He hasn't left you nor forsaken you. What a great God and father we have in heaven. Let us not soon forget that. But we see that all of these things lead to something else. Circumstantial theology and another lesson to be learned. You see, circumstantial theology has a way of, we lose, we lose of influencing us in a way that we lose our way in, in, in life. We lose our purpose. We lose his purpose. Therefore, we lose our purpose. The Lord turned to Gideon and said, look at verse 14. Gideon's finished with the Lord, but the Lord's not finished with Gideon. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have saved Israel out of Midian's hand. I am not, am I not sending you? So the Lord saying, go. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. Gideon responds with, pardon me, Lord. Verse 15, pardon me, my Lord. Again, not being polite, but being incredulous. Questioning even that statement and the authenticity, the veracity of that statement. How could the Lord say that? I'm still stuck. I'm still just trying to eke out a living here, and you're telling me to go and fight the uh, fight these people, the Midians? Hmm. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midians. God's purpose, God's purpose. What a great and awesome commission that Gideon was given. And Gideon's response, though. Though appearing to be polite was that he just didn't believe it. This time, it was followed up, though, the pardon me, with an excuse. What does he say? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The weakest and the least. The weak and the least. I'll tell you, folks, the Lord takes special delight in the weak and the least. That's what the Lord uses. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. That's good if you think you're weak, and you think you're not strong, and you think you're the least. That's good. That's exactly where God wants you. Because then you'll learn to rely on Him, and not your own strength. He takes special pleasure in using the weak and least for his purposes. You see, circumstantial theology, though, as it relates to purpose, what Gideon is also doing is questioning the sovereignty of God. You see, the the, the word sovereignty simply means God is in control of everything. When we truly understand God is in control of everything and Christians time and time again question God's sovereignty, therefore they'll question God's purposes and plans. I don't know all the answers to some of the issues and questions that people raise to me, whether it be the unbeliever saying, yeah, but how come that happened on the other side of the world? Or how come I'm going through this? I don't know. But I know that God is sovereign and he's in control. And we can debate over God purposely willed it, or God allowed it, his perfect will or his permissive will. But I know one thing, he is sovereign. And he's in control. Look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. In verse 24, the Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purpose, so it will happen. God's sovereignty, his purposes and his plans are going to come to fruition. Do you want to be a part of the Lord's purposes and plans? Whether you do or don't, God's still going to fulfill His purposes and plans. Are you going to align yourself with who God is and His purposes and plans for your life? They're not your purposes and plans. They're His purposes and plans for His glory and honor. And we need to be reminded of that. You see, circumstantial theology, and this lesson, lesson four, over the years I've, been, I've met many people and their reasons for uh, wanting to find God was so that God would maybe uh, help in a, a relationship that isn't, perhaps isn't from God in the first place. And therefore, I'll only believe in God and accept God if God fixes this for me. Or if God heals me, I'll believe in God. Or if God does something else for me. Or if, I, uh, if, if there's $100,000 deposited in my account, then I'll definitely follow God. That is circumstantial theology. God's purposes and plans may not be your purposes and plans. In fact, they're not. Because God's ways, as far as the, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are His ways above ours. We need to be reminded of this. You see, what is the excuse that we are giving to God, perhaps, this morning, concerning the Great Commission that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all. What about that great commission? What about sharing the gospel? You see, Gideon was going to be used not only to deliver himself, but to deliver others. The purpose and plans of God are not simply about you and your life, but that God can use you to minister to others. What about the work of the Lord? What about the ministry of prayer and all these things? Completely surrendered to God's purposes, recognizing His sovereignty. Let me share this 
uh, story in conclusion. Last night, maybe, you were sitting in your living room watching the hockey game on television. Hmm. The referee called, called a no goal on a play in which it appeared as though Montreal Canadiens scored a goal. I yelled to the ref through the TV, you're blind! <laughs> that was a goal! You know, I thought he made an incorrect decision because he couldn't see the play properly. What's wrong with this ref? Gallagher scored that goal. It wasn't high sticking. <laughs> but you know what? Then the cameras showed the, in the replay a different angle. And, uh, okay. and when you viewed from that different angle, you realized, you discovered that the referee was actually right. I apologize to the referee. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I was incorrect because I couldn't see the entire picture from my limited perspective. <laughs> to get the right perspective and purpose in life, we need to view our circumstances from heaven's point of view to have the right theology rather than the circumstantial theology. I trust this morning that you're, you're, you're willing to say, Lord, I'm surrendering all to you. I'm surrendering everything. No more circumstantial theology for me. From the first word in Genesis to the last word in Revelation, it's all true. And I want to align myself with you and your word, and I'm surrendered to do your will according to your way, your purposes, your glory. And we'll see that God is going to use Gideon following this in next week's message as we continue to study. When Gideon aligns himself with the Lord, what does he say? He realizes the sovereignty of God, a little later on, you see, God cooked up a meal for, um, uh, for Gideon, and I'm trusting that will work for me, because I'm home alone, and you know, I'm just going to put all the food out there and say, Lord, cook a meal for me, just like you did Gideon. See, the Lord, what did he do? Fire flared from the, lo the, the rock in verse 21, consumed the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Oh, hallelujah, a meal. And, but when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Mm -hmm. He's getting back, get back uh, he's aligning himself with God, recognizing God is sovereign. God has a purpose and a plan for everything in his life. Let's be reminded of that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your sovereignty. Oftentimes, we can be found grumbling about what isn't happening or wondering about why certain things are occurring in our lives or in the lives of others. And it can lead us to a point where we question, who, who are you, O oh God, to do such and such? However, you are sovereign. You are in control of all things. and Nothing happens without you. Your, your wisdom and your will. So Lord, may we surrender our lives to you afresh, that we may be used in a manner such as Gideon was, as we think of the needs of others, that you may use us to see others deliver from bondage, from bondage to sin and to slave and slaves to it, that they may be delivered and brought into the kingdom of your dear son in whom there is redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Lord, that we may live in the light of your promises with joy and peace. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name I pray.